Hello and welcome to the True Crime and Mystery Lounge. Happy Valentine's Day everyone. May your day be filled with love. Or at the very least, relaxing with some chocolates, wine, and your most cozy pajamas. Today we are going to take a look at someone that some might call handsome, others would call him creepy, and pretty much everyone would call him the essence of evil. Rodney Alcala, the dating game killer. Strap yourselves in, this one's going to be a long one because this bastard kept himself busy in the worst way possible. Rodney James Alcala was born Rodrigo Jacques Alcala Bocor on August 23, 1943 in San Antonio, Texas to parents Raul Alcala Bocor and Ana Maria Gutierrez. He had a brother and two sisters. In 1951, Rodney's father moved the family to Mexico. Soon after the move, Rodney's grandmother died. Then the father abandoned the family three years later. In 1954, when he was about 11 years old, Rodney's mother moved him and his siblings to suburban Los Angeles. Rodney went to Catholic schools and private schools. His peers at school would recall him as being very kind, respectful, and intelligent boy. His mother was very loving and supportive. His siblings would grow up to become very successful people. In 1961, at the age of 17, Rodney joined the United States Army and served as an administrative clerk. In 1964, that's when something snapped inside Rodney's head and he had a nervous breakdown. He went AWOL and hitchhiked from Fort Bragg to his mother's house, which was the first place the military police would look for him. Once he was caught and brought back, Military psychiatrists diagnosed Rodney with antisocial personality disorder. He was discharged on medical grounds. In 1964, after being discharged from the Army, Rodney enrolled in the UCLA School of Fine Arts with a major in photography and graduated in 1968. It was a warm sunny day on September 25th, 1968. Eight-year-old Tally Shapiro was wearing a dress that her grandmother had crocheted for her and her white Mary Jane shoes. When a man in a car pulls up and asks if she needs a ride to school, Tally told the man that she doesn't talk to strangers. He says that he knows her parents and that it's okay. Tally didn't really want to get in the car, but she was taught to respect her elders, so she agreed and got in the car. He asked her what time school starts. After telling him, realizing that they had plenty of time, he said he wanted to swing by his apartment and show her a poster that she might like. Once she heard that, she felt like she wanted to jump out of the car. An eyewitness who saw the whole thing and just had a gut feeling that something was off decided he was going to follow the car all the way back to the kidnapper's apartment. Then he found the nearest phone to call the police. Police arrived, knocking on the door. A naked man peeked out of the window and said to give him a few minutes to put on some clothes because he had just taken a shower. The officer, noticing that the man didn't look like he had just taken a shower, didn't buy it and told him you have three seconds to open this door or he's kicking it in. He made good on this threat and kicked the door open to find the naked man running out the back door and little Tally laying in the kitchen covered with blood. Her clothes were laying in a pile and a metal bar was laying across her throat. The officer had to make the difficult decision to either catch the guy or save the little girl. He chose to save the little girl, who was barely clinging on to life. Tally was rushed to the hospital. She was in a coma for 32 days. The doctors didn't think that she would make it. Tally was a fighter and survived after several months in the hospital. While Tally was in the hospital, investigators searched the apartment and found the man's college ID that he had left behind. They finally had a name for this monster. Rodney James Alcala. Rodney fled to New York City and enrolled in NYU Film School, where he studied film under Roman Polanski, but he registered under the name John Berger. In 1971, he obtained a counseling job at a New Hampshire arts camp for children using a slightly different alias of John Berger, spelled with a U instead of an E. This is also the same year that the FBI finally added Rodney to the list of 10 most wanted fugitives. In June of 1971, 23-year-old TWA flight attendant Cornelia Criley was found raped and strangled in her Manhattan apartment. Her case remained cold until 2011. 
One day, while attending art camp, two kids take a walk down the dirt road to a nearby post office to mail a letter. While they're there, it starts pouring down rain. So they decide to explore the post office while waiting for the rain to stop. They find a bulletin board with pictures of the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives and recognize a familiar face and said, hey, that's Mr. Berger. After the rain stops, the kids run back to the camp and inform the head counselor. The head counselor tells them not to say anything and goes to the post office to confirm what they saw. He heads back to camp and calls the FBI. Rodney was arrested and extradited back to California. By then, the Shapiros had relocated their entire family to Mexico and refused to allow Tally to testify at Rodney's trial. Since the authorities were unwilling to charge him with rape and attempted murder without their primary witness, Rodney was convicted of child molestation and was sentenced to three years in prison. He didn't even serve all of it because he was a model inmate so he got out after only serving 17 months and was released on parole in 1974. I know, I know, I'm shaking my head in disgust too. Like, what the hell? Seems like Rodney didn't learn his lesson. Only two months after his release, he was rearrested for assaulting a 13-year-old girl identified in court records as Julie J, who had accepted what she thought would be a ride to school. Plus, he was charged with parole violation and possession of marijuana. Rodney was again paroled in 1976 after serving two years. In 1977, Rodney asked his parole officer, which was a different one this time, if he could go on vacation. Even though Rodney is a repeat offender and a flight risk, his parole officer gives him permission anyways. Seriously, what the hell? He drove to New York City and within a week, he kills another lady, 23-year-old Ellen Jane Hover, the daughter of Herman Hover, the owner of a popular Hollywood nightclub, Ciro's, and goddaughter of Dean Martin and Sammy Davis Jr. No one suspected Rodney at this time because this was the same year that the Son of Sam murders were happening. So he flew under the radar at first. Police searched Ellen's apartment and found that she wrote on her calendar an appointment for a photo shoot with a man by the name of John Berger. Her remains were found a year later, buried under heavy rocks on a hillside overlooking the Hudson River, about a half mile west of the Phelps Memorial Hospital in Terrytown in Westchester County at the Rockefeller Estate. He was later questioned by police, but they didn't have enough evidence to arrest him. In 1978, Rodney briefly worked for the Los Angeles Times as a typesetter. How the hell he got that job under his real name, I have no foggy clue. During this year, Rodney convinced hundreds of men and women that he was a professional fashion photographer and photographed them for his portfolio. A Times co-worker later recalled that Rodney shared his photos with co-workers. Quote, I thought it was weird, but I was young. I didn't know anything, she said. When asked why he took the photos, he said their moms asked him to. I remember the girls were naked." Unquote. He was interviewed by members of the Hillside Strangler Task Force as part of their investigation of known sex offenders. Although Rodney was ruled out as the Hillside Strangler, he was arrested and served a brief sentence for marijuana possession. In the summer of 1978, after serving out his marijuana possession charge, Weeks later, he auditioned for the popular game show, The Dating Game, hence how he got his nickname later on. Of course, he poured on the charm and passed the audition, becoming bachelor number one. Although at first, executive producer Mike Metzger said no way to having Rodney on the show because he had a bad feeling about him, his wife, talent coordinator Ellen Metzger, was adamant to cast him. The episode aired on September 13, 1978. Host Jim Lang introduced him as a successful photographer who got his start when his father found him in the darkroom at the age of 13, fully developed. Between takes, you might find him skydiving or motorcycling. If you cringed at that line, trust me, it gets worse. The questions the Bachelorette, Cheryl Bradshaw, asked were no better. The show was filled with sexual innuendos, which I'm pretty sure nowadays wouldn't fly. One of the worst was when Cheryl asked, 
I'm serving you for dinner. What are you called and what do you look like? Rodney answered, I am called the banana and I look really good. She asked him to be more descriptive. He responds, peel me. He poured on the charm so much that Rodney won the date. It was an all-expenses paid date, which was tennis lessons with new outfits for the date, and then a trip to Magic Mountain Amusement Park. It seemed like a pretty wholesome date, despite how dirty the show is. Once they were backstage, getting to know each other better, Cheryl said that he gave her creepy vibes. So following her gut instinct, she refused to go out on a date with Rodney. The next day, Cheryl called Ellen and said, Ellen, I can't go out with this guy. There's weird vibes coming off of him. He's very strange. I'm not comfortable. Is that going to be a problem? And of course, Ellen said, no, it's not a problem. To me, Cheryl didn't dodge a bullet, she dodged a missile. I'm glad she didn't ignore her gut. The other bachelors didn't really like Rodney either. Fellow contestant Jed Mills had the same conclusion when he was chatting with Rodney before going on stage. Years later, he recalled, he was very obnoxious and creepy. He became very unlikable and rude and imposing as though he were trying to intimidate. He was a standout creepy guy in my life. If you want to watch the episode, there will be a link in the description box below, but I warn you, it is super cringe. On June 20th, 1979, at 2.30 p.m., 12-year-old Robin Samso and her friend Bridget were sunbathing and just having a fun time on Huntington Beach. A strange man approached the two girls and asked if he could take their pictures. Both of them refused. Seeing that something was very off, an adult came over to check up on the girls and scared off the stranger. The two girls left the beach and headed back for Bridget's house. Robin had to leave and head for her ballet class at 4 p.m., but she realized she wasn't going to make it on time by walking, so Bridget let Robin use her bike and told her not to stop for anyone. At 5 p.m., Robin's brother called Bridget to ask if Robin was still there. She told him that Robin had already left. She borrowed my bike to get to class. He told her that she never showed up to the dance studio. Robin's mother waited for another hour for Robin to show up at the house, but she never came back. So police were called to make a missing persons report. Bridget was introduced to a sketch artist and gave him the description of the man they saw. Once the artist was done, Bridget said, yep, that's him. The sketch was circulated and Rodney's parole officer recognized him. Twelve days later, Robin's skeletal remains were found 40 miles away from where she was last seen. Rodney was finally arrested at his mother's house on July 24, 1979 and held without bail. Police got a search warrant to search his mother's house and found a receipt for a storage locker in Seattle, Washington. One of his sisters went to visit Rodney in jail and they started talking about the storage locker. Rodney told his sister to go empty the locker, but police managed to get there before her. They found a ton of evidence, including a box containing thousands of photographs taken of young men, women, and children. Some are in compromising positions, and a lot of them are nude. There was also a small pouch containing jewelry, mainly earrings. One pair that caught the investigator's attention was a pair of gold ball earrings. Robin's mother said, that she was wearing gold ball earrings on the day that she disappeared. Rodney, of course, denied ever being in Huntington Beach and gives very little information during interrogation. The first trial for the murder of Robin Samso was in 1980. After five hours of deliberation, the jury came back with a guilty verdict and sentenced Rodney to death. In 1984, Rodney appealed his case, and a verdict was overturned by the California Supreme Court because jurors had been improperly informed of his prior sex crimes. In 1986, after a second trial virtually identical to the first except the omission of the prior criminal record testimony, he was again convicted and sentenced to death. But this slippery bastard was able to get his death row sentence overturned again for the second time in 2001. This time the appeal claim was ineffective counsel, meaning Rodney's defense lawyer didn't present a proper case in his defense. What is it going to take to finally put this bastard away?
The investigators now had to find more evidence to finally secure a conviction. In 2003, Orange County investigators did DNA testing on other cases that they suspected Rodney was involved in. And sure enough, they found a match to four more women. Along with additional evidence, they were able to charge him with the murders of 18-year-old Jill Barkham, a New York runaway found rolled up like a ball in a Los Angeles ravine in 1977, who was originally thought to have been a victim of the Hillside Strangler. 27-year-old Georgia Wickstead, who was found bludgeoned in her Malibu apartment, also in 1977. 31-year-old Charlotte Lamb, who was raped, strangled, and left in a laundry room of an El Segundo apartment complex in 1978. And 21-year-old Jill Parento, who was killed in her Burbank apartment in 1979. All of the bodies were found posed in carefully chosen positions. Another pair of earrings were found in Rodney's storage locker that had residue that matched Charlotte Lamb's DNA. Oh, and during this time, in prison between the second and third trials, Rodney wrote a self-published book titled You the Jury, in which he claimed innocence in the Samso case and suggested a different suspect, truly the signs of a narcissist. He also filed two lawsuits against the California penal system for a slip and fall accident and for refusing to provide him a low-fat diet. In 2003, prosecutors entered a motion to join the Samso charges with those of the four newly discovered victims. Rodney's attorneys contested it. As one of them explained, quote, if you're a juror and you hear one murder case, you might be able to have reasonable doubt, but it's hard to say you have reasonable doubt on all five, especially when four of the five aren't alleged by eyewitnesses but are proven by DNA matches, unquote. In 2006, the California Supreme Court ruled in the prosecution's favor, and in February 2010, Rodney stood trial on all five joint charges. As the saying goes, he who represents himself in court has a fool for a client. Rodney was definitely that fool. Ted Bundy was at least a law student, so he did have some knowledge of what he was doing. Rodney graduated from art school, so all he could do is put on a show. After all, he is the smartest man he knows. Rodney took the stand in his own defense and for five hours played the roles of both interrogator and witness, asking himself questions, addressing himself as Mr. Alcala in a deeper than normal voice, and then answering them. During this self-questioning and answering session, he told jurors, often in a rambling monotone, that he was at Knott's Berry Farm, applying for a job as a photographer at the time Robin was kidnapped. He showed the jurors a portion of his 1978 appearance on the dating game in an attempt to prove that the earrings found in his Seattle locker were his, not Robin's. But the problem was, you couldn't even see his ears because of all that hair. Of course, he also got to cross-examine a lot of the witnesses, including Robin's mother, getting within only a few feet away from her. Rodney made no significant attempt to dispute the four added charges, other than to assert that he could not remember killing any of the women. Richard Rappaport, a psychiatrist paid by Rodney and the only defense witness, testified that borderline personality disorder could explain Rodney's claims that he had no memory of committing the murders. Rodney had been diagnosed during all three of his trials by various psychiatric experts, including narcissistic personality disorder, borderline personality disorder, a malignant narcissism with psychopathy, and sexual sadism comorbidities. As part of his closing argument, he played the Arlo Guthrie song, Alice's Restaurant, in which the protagonist tells a psychiatrist that he wants to kill. The prosecutor argued that Rodney was a sexual predator who knew what he was doing was wrong and didn't care, because he would strangle his victims until they were almost at the brink of death, then revive them, and then do it again. After less than two days of deliberation, the jury convicted him of all five counts of first-degree murder. During the penalty phase of his trial, a surprise witness showed up in court, Tally Shapiro, Rodney's first known victim. Now a grown woman in her 50s, she spoke about the assault that she had no memory of, but which left emotional scars on her psyche well into adulthood. Rodney apologized to her for the first time, which didn't go over well. She later stated, 
quote, he's never apologized before, and for him to even bother, I mean, that made me sick to my stomach, unquote. This was the only attempt Rodney made at conveying remorse for any of his actions, conveniently during a crucial time in which the jury has to decide whether to recommend a life sentence or the death penalty. On March 9, 2010, after only two hours of deliberation, the jury sentenced him to death. But it's not over yet. In March 2010, the Huntington Beach, California, and New York City Police Departments released 120 of Rodney's photographs and sought the public's help in identifying them in the hope of determining if any of the women and children he photographed were additional victims. Approximately 900 additional photos could not be made public because they were too sexually explicit. In the first few weeks, police reported that approximately 21 women had come forward to identify themselves, and at least six families said they believed they recognized loved ones who disappeared years ago and were never found. None of the photos were unequivocally connected to the missing person's case or unsolved murder until 2013. When a family member recognized the photo of Christine Thornton, age 28, whose body was found in Wyoming in 1982. As of July 2022, 110 of the original photos remain posted online, and police continue to solicit the public's help with any further identifications. In January 2011, a Manhattan grand jury indicted Rodney Alcala for the murders of Cornelia Criley, the TWA flight attendant, and Ellen Hover, the Ceros heiress, in 1971 and 1977, respectively. In June 2012, he was extradited to New York, where he initially entered a not guilty plea on both counts, but then in December 2012, he changed both pleas to guilty, citing a desire to return to California to pursue appeals of his death penalty conviction. On January 7, 2013, a Manhattan judge sentenced him to an additional 25 years to life. The death penalty has not been an option in New York State since 2007. In 2010, Seattle police named Rodney as a person of interest in the unsolved murders of Antoinette Whitaker, age 13, in July 1977, and Joyce Gaunt, age 17, in February 1978, along with the unsolved disappearance of 20-year-old Cherry Ann Greenman on September 14, 1976. Rodney rented a Seattle area storage locker in which investigators later found jewelry belonging to two of his California victims in 1979. In March 2011, investigators in Marin County, California, north of San Francisco, announced they were confident that Rodney was responsible for the 1977 murder of 19-year-old Pamela Jean Lamson who disappeared after making a trip to Fisherman's Wharf to meet a man who had offered to photograph her. Her battered, naked body was subsequently found in Marin County near a hiking trail. With no useful fingerprints or usable DNA, charges were never filed. But police claimed there was sufficient evidence to convince them that Rodney had committed the crime. In September 2016, Rodney was charged with the murder of 28-year-old Christine Thornton, who disappeared in 1977. In 2013, a relative recognized her as the subject of one of Rodney's photos made public by Huntington Beach PD and NYPD. Her body was found in Sweetwater County, Wyoming in 1982, but was not identified until 2015 when DNA supplied by Christine's relatives matched the tissue samples from her remains. But Rodney was too ill to be extradited to Wyoming. Even though he was charged, he was never convicted. Robin's mother had one wish after Rodney was sentenced to death for the third time, to watch him get executed, to finally see that monster die. But sadly, on July 23, 2019, she passed away. And because of a moratorium put in place in 2019, Everyone that is on California's death row have a stay of execution for now. On July 24th, 2021, the monster breathed his last breath on this earth. 
Rodney Alcala died of unspecified natural causes in a hospital in Cochran, California. He was 77 years old. The victim's families were happy to learn that his final years were spent bedridden and suffering. And now he can't hurt anyone else ever again. I know that was a lot and this video was so long, but like I said, this slippery bastard kept himself very busy for over a decade. When it comes to serial killers, old Rodney is one of those guys that kind of flew under the radar for a lot of people. During the 60s through the 80s, there were a lot of serial killers making headlines all across America. Ted Bundy being the most infamous. He was arrested a year prior. To me, Rodney Alcala is a fine example of what happens when you don't do background checks before putting him on a game show, being a camp counselor for children, and even getting a job with the LA Times. I know that he bragged about having a genius IQ ranging somewhere between 160 to 170, but if he was so smart, then why couldn't he come up with another alias instead of using the same name just spelled differently? And of course, leaving his DNA and taking photos of his victims and keeping jewelry. He obviously wasn't that smart. He just got lucky until his luck ran out. Some described him as handsome, but to me, he looks like a knockoff Weird Al Yankovic. I guess the bar wasn't set that high back in the day. Just a good head of hair and some tight bell bottoms, and you're deemed a catch. If you made it this far into the video, thank you. And if you found this video interesting, please smash that like button. And if you really like what I do, subscribe, will you? When you do, don't forget to tickle that little bell icon so that you don't miss out on the next episode. You never know who I will cover next. Thanks for hanging out with me in the True Crime and Mystery Lounge. This is Phoenix signing out. Have a happy Valentine's Day and stay safe.